Welcome back to the Simple Farmhouse Life podcast. Today I'm going to be sharing four things that I've learned having a dairy cow for two months. Plus I'm going to do a dairy cow Q&A. So I put it up on my Instagram and asked for questions of what people want to know. Whether you have any intention whatsoever of getting a dairy cow or if you're just simply curious, I find that there are people in both camps when it comes to this. I was just curious what people wanted to know and I got a lot of the same questions over and over again, so I'm gonna, going to address those as well. My name is Lisa, mom of six and creator of the blog and YouTube channel, Farmhouse on Boone. Join me as I share with you my love for creating a handmade home from scratch cooking and a little mom and entrepreneur life along the way. Today's podcast is brought to you by my free one hour blogging success masterclass. If you've ever wanted to start your own business or you're just curious about how my husband and I are able to stay home with our six kids on this homestead day after day, sharing our life, I share how we made that happen with blogging. Now currently we have a YouTube channel, we have Instagram followers, but when Luke quit his job over three years ago, we were primarily relying on our blog, and that is what I am teaching people. How you can create the kind of content that people wanna read, how you can niche down so that you actually are able to find your select group of people and monetize that audience. I go into depth on things that career bloggers know that maybe people who are just starting out definitely do not know, things that I learned the hard way, you can find my free masterclass over at bit.ly forward slash farmhouse blogging school. That's bit.ly forward slash farmhouse blogging school, all one word. All right, so I'm sure that I've learned a lot more than four things in these last two months, but I basically broke this down into four things that are easy to list off and share with you. The first thing I learned is the calf can nurse through a cattle panel. Now, a lot of these things, they're things that other homesteaders told me, and it, I kind of knew in the back of my head, but until you experience it for yourself, you know, you're not really exactly sure how that would work. So when the calf was about two weeks old, we wanted to start separating her at night, just like we did with the goats. Remember, we milked them last year. With cows having an accelerated lifespan, like, you know, with humans, around six months to a year, they are biologically ready to be able to sleep through the night. And even though they aren't nursing all night, they can make up the calories during the day. We all know this as humans, how our babies work. Well, cows, they are having calves of their own at 18 months. So they are obviously ready a lot sooner to be separated from their mom at night. And what happens with homesteaders is at a certain point, you're not getting very much milk because the calf is just taking it all, which is great because it does allow you some flexibility in your milking schedule, which I'll go more on in a little bit. But if you do want to get milk from a cow, you have to separate them for a length of time. And so we built this little enclosure in the barn where we would separate the cow and the calf for a period of time overnight i'd milk her in the morning and then we would put them back together in the pasture for the day now the first thing we tried was we have basically our entire property is fenced in like a giant u so there's a gate at the front and then there are fences around the yard and then there's fences around the perimeter and so you can't get through from this side to this side. There's just our driveway here, but you could go all the way around the U to get to the other side. And when I first tried this at two weeks old, I put the cow on one side and the calf on the other, so that way they could still see each other across the driveway. But I never imagined that they would figure out the U because at this point they had never been in the other section at all. They only just hung out on the front pasture. They never ventured around the back and all the way to the other side. And there was a lot of mooing. I could tell that they weren't happy about it. And somewhere around three in the morning, they found each other. I know this because my window was open because it was a nice night. This was several weeks ago, it was sometime in July. 
and I, I just heard of them a lot and then I stopped hearing them somewhere around three in the morning and when I found them in the morning, sure enough, they'd found each other. So that was a fail and I knew we had to go back to figuring something else out, back to the drawing board. So what we ended up doing was building that little enclosure in the barn and they would be right next to each other. So basically, if you remember our goat setup, we have a little pin that is built next to the barn in the silo and we brought the goats in there and then at night we'd put the goats up into a little house that we now use for the chickens. We put the baby goats in there, but cows are much bigger. So you can't just go throwing them in this little chicken house type of thing. They need more space than that. The calf is already way bigger than our dog, who's a huge dog. And so Luke just built this little enclosure off of that and they're basically going to be separated by a cattle panel only. So if you aren't a farm person, a cattle panel is just like a piece of fencing, but it's very heavy duty. You can set it up without really stretching it. It, it's, you, it might seem sort of like a gate, but it has these squares in it that are about, or rectangles, that are about this size. Um, if you're watching this, you can see, but if you are listening on Apple Podcasts or whatever, or Spotify, I would say that the cattle panel holes, just completely estimating, are like six inches by four inches. And so nothing can really get through it. I mean, chickens can, but I didn't expect that the calf could actually nurse through it. And people told me that this would happen. And I thought, you know what, I'm just going to try it and see what happens. And the first morning that I went and got the cow after being separated from her calf for approximately 12 hours, I was still getting the same half gallon that I was getting before we started separating them, which I am not into keeping a cow, feeding a cow, fencing in a cow and all of the work for a half gallon of milk a day. And I really bet that most of you wouldn't either. I definitely get some comments from people who are upset about the calf, which I'm gonna go more into in a little bit, who maybe don't understand that they are biologically able to be separated at this point, who would definitely not keep a pet cow with no reward for it because it's expensive and you're taking care of them, feeding them organic feed, fencing in a pasture, so much work, you need to get milk out of the situation. That is just what makes sense. And I, I just can't imagine any of these people who are responding to my stories with negative comments about the milk being for the calf. One, I don't think they grew up on a farm. It just, they couldn't have. And two, I really wanna know how many pet cows they keep on hand and take good care of just in order to pet them. I wasn't sure if she was really nursing through it. So I thought, I'll give this another night. And so we gave it about another week and I was still just getting very little milk, sometimes as little as a quart in the morning, which is what I used to get with the goats, which is not okay. The reason that we went, switched from goats to a cow was to have this abundant milk and cream and be able to never run out of milk and that wasn't gonna happen. So we put up one night a board in it just like we just put a board along the cattle panel and the next morning I easily milked out a gallon. Now that was really exciting and it confirmed to me that she was definitely nursing through the cattle panel. I talked to other people who said the exact same thing happened to them. They had no clue why they weren't getting much milk and it was the same thing. But then I learned something else. Now this was the second thing on my list of things that I learned having a dairy cow for two months is that moms are very good at holding back the milk for their calves, which is an amazing thing. It's really cool to see. And I knew it was true. And I had a lot of homesteaders that actually gave me this tip, but I, I was hesitant to do it for a few reasons. So the tip is allow the calf out in the morning, so after you milk out whatever you can get, say it's a half a gallon or a gallon or whatever, and then the cow won't give you any more milk, and it appears that her udders are completely empty, put the calf on, she will stimulate them, and then the cow will let down all the milk. And they told me that, and I was sure that it you know, was probably a good idea, but I was hesitant to do it because I thought, one, this calf isn't tame enough yet for me to 
work with her and have her nurse for a little bit and then pull her away. She was just such a wild thing. I think she's even more wild than the average Jersey because she is half Brahma and she's just a little bit spunky and wild. And I'm sure to an extent all calves are that way, but she just seemed extra so. And so I was like, I don't really know how that's supposed to work. Her udders feel very empty to me. So I just really don't think that there's any more milk there. But one morning we discovered it by accident. I wasn't even trying to do it. I just let the calf out. The cow was still eating her grain that we feed her whenever we're milking her. And whenever I went over there, because the calf, of course, found her mom, they moved to each other, find each other, she started nursing. I inspected her udders and I was like, oh my gosh, they are as full as, there's probably a gallon or more of milk. She had been completely holding it back. I also had no cream line on my milk. So we were milking, we chose a Jersey because they give so much cream. And I was getting like this much cream on the top of my milk. It turns out she was just holding it all back just for the calf. And so now I have this nice, huge cream line with this new trick, which is allow the calf to help you get the milk to let down. Now, again, this is another thing that people get really upset about. Well, if she's holding it back, the calf needs it. The calf is now two months old. And in a lot of commercial dairies, calves, calves are actually weaned at this point. You can have them completely on feed and, or calf starter. I'm not exactly sure how it all works, but I do know that they can be weaned at this point. And they also, just like with humans, work on supply and demand. So if we are now taking a gallon and a half of milk or whatever we can get after the calf lets the milk down, they will go to the pasture and all day the calf will be nursing to make up for that and then the cow will actually produce more. Just like when you pump, you know, in human terms, you pump and then you think, well, how does that work? And then there's not gonna be any milk left for the baby, but there always is because your body works on that supply and demand. It's the same. And so this is a situation where the calf is getting plenty of milk because she has 12 hours a day of access, free access to pasture, to hay, to her mother's milk all day. And then 12 hours at night where she has access to calf starter and hay and water. She is getting plenty, she's growing, she's huge, she's healthy. But we again, needed to troubleshoot how to be able to get milk and cream from this massive cow that we are taking care of. So that solution has worked so well for us. The calf is a lot tamer now. So the first couple days whenever I was doing this, I was allowing the calf to nurse on one side, which there's obviously four quarters. So she would be nursing on one of them and then I would be tugging from the others. And then when she would switch, I would switch. But there was a few problems. I had to constantly be wiping because there was like calf slobber on it. And then also they are very rough. If you've ever watched an animal nurse, they beat their head into the udders. And so she would like knock the pail out of my hand. And so what I've started doing the last two days, because this is new, I've only been doing this calf trick for like five days and it's amazing. I get another gallon or gallon and a half after the calf comes and it's like this creamy, like the best milk is all right there. But now what I've done is while she's nursing, I just actually tie her up, milk a little bit more. Then I lead the calf to the pasture and then I let the cow out of her milking stanchion and then she goes straight to her calf and then they're just out in the pasture for the day. So I no longer have to contend with the calf while getting the milk, which is great. All right, the next thing that I've learned is that they are very adaptable to a routine. So the first several days that we were separating the cow from the calf, I was thinking about getting rid of the calf. I was thinking, you know, she, she could be sold. She's a good dairy breed. It was very difficult. She would come out of the fence that we have the pasture in and just run crazy all over the yard. We couldn't catch her. It was hard because I had a halter on her at one point. I got the halter on her when she was little and then I couldn't catch her again for several weeks because she was so crazy. And then the halter started getting too tight. And so I had to catch her in order to loosen her halter. 
And then I just pulled the halter off because I just couldn't get it and so it came off and then she just was had no halter. And so she was just very difficult to catch. Every single day when we had to bring the cow in from the pasture and the calf and then separate the two of them in their little pens for the night in the barn where they're separated by the one cattle panel, it was just such a thing. It was like, okay, we need to get home because we gotta do that job. This could take like an hour. We're gonna be chasing a calf all over the yard and it was not fun. The last week, or two now probably um, since we have gotten really into the, this routine and they've been doing this every night it is the easiest thing the cow hears the little grain bucket because I give her a little bit of grain to get her in so she's basically waiting for me at the gate she leads in super easy sometimes you don't even have to tie her up sometimes she just follows the grain bucket the calf comes in behind her and now the calf knows that that little gate that leads to her little pin is hers and she'll just run in there. I mean, it is crazy. I never thought it would happen. I thought that this was gonna be like a rodeo every single night, but they're so used to this routine. It's about the same time every night. We do it around 7.30 or eight o'clock. We bring them in and then the cow calf goes in her little pin and the cow goes in hers and they're both really used to it. There's no mooing at night. The separation, they both seem like completely comfortable and easy with. Neither of them are stressed about it. They just go right in. They just know where to go. And so the that really surprised me and I'm really glad I didn't give up so quickly because I hope that this calf will also be a dairy cow for us someday. My big plan was that someday we would alternate. So like we'd breed one cow and then we would milk her and then the alternate year we would breed the next and then we just back and forth. That way there wasn't just one cow with all of the burden. But whether or not that's exactly how it'll all work, it worked out in my head that way. I do think that I would always like to keep two cows. And so I thought this would be perfect. She's a female, she's a good dairy breed. I will have her from birth and so she'll be really used to us and tame and then she was crazy. Um, but that is definitely changing. She lets me get near her now. I can pet her, she knows where to go, she knows you know, they both know that, okay, we go in these little pens at night, we get hay, and then in the morning, after I get milked, I will be re reunited in the pasture. And it's just like real easy because they know. Also, in the morning, whenever I take the cow in to do the milking, which the calf is still in her little pen at this point, all I have to do is bring the bucket of grain and she just follows me over to the milk stand. There was one time that I was trying to get her to go somewhere else, and I forget what for, but she just ran to the milk stand. She didn't even follow me or anything. She just came out and went to the milk stand because she assumed that's what we were doing and we weren't. But it was really funny because they just, they learn that routine so easily that it, it just becomes, it becomes a lot easier than that first couple of weeks where you're not sure. Okay, and then the last thing that I've been learning about, I'm in the process of learning, is how to keep condition on a cow and what to feed them. I really did, didn't know, I knew very little about this. And I think back to when I was interviewing different dairies for finding raw milk and asking them, okay, do you feed them any grain? Do they only have grass? And all of the dairy farmers would be like, we feed them grain when we're milking. And I'd be like, ah, oh, I want exclusively grass fed. And now I realize, I mean, and I'm sure this is different depending on your pasture and many other factors, like what type of breed a cow. But our cow will not stay at a nice weight without the grain. And so that is just how it has been working for us. And so finding a good dairy ration for her was something that was really important. I even had to add in a few things that I didn't really know that would be necessary in order to even add more condition to the cow. So we do a mixture of barley, oats, and I order these organic from a local feed store. Alfalfa pellets, I added in a little bit of sunflower seeds. Um, I have some friends who are giving me their dairy ration recipe and they don't do the sunflower seeds but I read that it would help whenever the calf was first born, the milk had a really salty taste, which I know is a sign of mastitis, but she also didn't have any of the other symptoms of mastitis. 
And I read that sunflower seeds would help with that. And it did phase out. It was probably like a week of the milk, milk tasting salty. And then she didn't have to have any treatment or anything, but it ended up tasting great. I don't know if that's from the sunflower seeds or if there was just something with just having the calf that caused that. But I've been adding in like a little scoop of sunflower seeds each day so that she gets the largest portion of the barley, oats, and uh, alfalfa pellets and then just a little scoop of sunflower seeds i also started adding in beet pulp i read this in my keeping a family cow group and the reason that i was looking for information on getting her to be better condition which just means like a healthier weight and somebody recommended that beet pulp and so i've been adding that in i don't know if i'll buy another bag when it's gone because i feel like she's at a really better place now um, I think it might have just been recovering from having the calf and all of that, but she just seemed skinny. Now, side note, dairy cows are skinny. They look nothing like beef cows. I've been told by many that my cow looks great. However, from people who aren't farmers, I get lots of comments about how skinny she is. Just know that they definitely look, even in their best optimal condition, way different than beef cows. You're supposed to see the bones sticking out. That's just how it is. That does not mean they're too thin. Now there is a certain point at which if it's too sunken in at the spot where the rumen is, or if you see the ribs too much that you wanna maybe add some condition, but they are supposed to be skinny. That is what's healthy for them. That is what is good for them. Obviously there is a point where they're too skinny, but they will never look like a beef cow and they never should look like a beef cow. And then I also add in like, I think it's four ounces. I just do like a handful every day of mineral. So she doesn't get like loose choice mineral. I probably at some point should do that. I just add it into her feed at milking time and then at night. Um, actually, no, I don't add it in the nightly feed because it's just per day. They're supposed to have about four ounces. So all of that's been a learning curve. But what's great is you don't have to know all of this before you start. So I knew nothing about this at all. As you know, if you follow along, my cow had her calf two months early. It was really just an error on dating. She was not two months early. She was perfectly on time. And that night we had, or actually not that night, but like the next day a family come and help us build a milk stand, which was great. Uh, they helped us build that and then I didn't have any feed. They're like, well, you need feed to get her in here, especially for the first time. So I ran in the house. I threw in some like oatmeal that I had and I had some barley up in the pantry. I just like made feed from all of the random grains that we just had around the house. It worked great. I also added in a little bit of molasses, but I had no animal feed at all. And so it was just like whatever I could come up with in the house and it worked perfect. And then from there, I went and picked up some feed just from like Orchelin that wasn't organic. And then I ordered all the good feed and then that's where we've been ever since on the organic feed. But it was totally fine, even if I didn't know it. I get motivated to do research whenever I'm thrown into something. And so that was that. Was that. I was thrown into it. You figure it out really quickly and then quickly you learn everything that you need to know as the issues come up. You can ask friends who have cows. There are so many people online who've been so helpful. So Venison for Dinner, Crafty Gemini, my friend Julie Crakey, that's the family that came and helped us build the milk stand and tell us what their dairy ration is and where they get their feed because they're local. So now we're getting feed from the same place. But you make these connections, you find ways to get your questions answered. I asked so many on the Facebook group called Keeping a Family Cow. And people are quick to answer, quick to weigh in on whether or not your cow is too skinny or what's this weird spot on them. You can find the answers that you need and quickly. All right, the next thing I'm gonna do is go over into the Q&A on Instagram and answer some of your questions about this. I got a lot of the same questions over and over again. One is on the health of raw milk and how it is safe. And I was taking so many notes and compiling research because this is something that our family has been doing and consuming for 11 years now. So I'm just kind of past the point of not trusting it at this point because we have raised our entire family. Our oldest daughter, who is going to be 13 this year, 
was one when we started drinking raw milk. And so, of course, I'm at a place where I'm like, of course it's, it, you know, I have all of these thoughts about it because we have been consuming it for so long. But I was in that stage of research way back then when we started. But as I was compiling the health benefits of raw milk and, you know, the safety of it, I started thinking about something that I find really fascinating. And that is when you're so involved in a process. So every day when I take June out to milk her, I have hot water and I have rags and I know where she slept last night and the cleanliness of that space and I know exactly what she's eating and I'm cleaning each teat and I'm making sure there's you know nothing on them that that's gross and I'm squirting out the first high bacteria count milk because there can be a little bit of bacteria left on her teat and finding it interesting that that process is the thing that we question the safety on but yet when we go to the store we buy anything we are trusting a whole line of people that handled and processed along the way and we don't even eh, that's not even something we worry about but if we're going to be getting something from a, a local farmer who you know they can literally tell you firsthand what the cow ate, where the cow lives, how they clean the udders. They can tell you that they drank it that week and you know they're all healthy and you can see all the parts that go into it. It's really interesting to me that that is the thing we have to question and worry about and not the one where we're just putting all of our trust into all of these people and this whole process along the line. And I was telling Luke that one day because when you really get your hands into something, so whether you're raising chickens and you know, you learn that if the coop isn't super clean, the eggs are like really gross and filthy and you have to wash them. But whenever you don't see that, it's like it never happened. It never really came from a farm. It never really ever got poopy or, you know, it's, it's interesting to me that once you see it, it's like now it's real and it really like milk really does come from an animal and not store shelves so like an animal that poops and pees and it makes you realize that that's where everything comes from and to be able to go straight to the source is it's just interesting that we like don't trust that so i don't know i was I was struggling with so many questions about like, well, how do you know it's safe? Do you boil it? Do you put it through any kind of process or what do you do? And I mean, here's my answer for all of that. You make sure that everything is clean. You need to have clean jars. You need to have clean rags. I bring out three rags with me every day. The first rag is just to like generally clean the whole udders area. Then the second one is to wipe away like any residual residue or whatever might be on there. So that's like super clean. Then those rags I put aside, I don't put them back into the hot water. And then I squeeze a little bit out of each teat to like, you know, if there was anything left on the teat or whatever. So now they're looking like really clean and the first squirt is all squirted out. And then I milk. And then I bring the calf over and she makes the milk let down. And then I take that third rag, I wipe away all the calf slobber. They're clean at this point. The only difference is that now there is some calf slobber on there, which I feel like is probably not horrible. It's like getting kissed by your dog. But I wipe that away and then I milk. And then I take that inside quickly. I filter it in case any like hair fell into it or sometimes a piece of grain or you know something like that will fall into it. I strain that out, there's always very little. You can see like hardly anything in that. And then you quickly get it into the refrigerator because bacteria grows at room temperature quickly. So you get it in the refrigerator and, and then it's good. And so I don't worry about it beyond that. Now, I did a quick search in my Keeping a Family Cow group just to see like what do other people do? Am I crazy? Because I've never even thought about testing the milk. I've never. I've never remotely worried about this at all. I would be way more skeptical of something that I didn't see 
the whole process of, I didn't know what they're eating. But that being said, I know that some people aren't at that spot just yet, just with the, you know, like, it's like deprogramming your brain because of how much like you've heard over the years and then you end up like trying something and learning something a little bit different. And so I understand that that's not how everybody feels. And so I actually did like a quick search in that group and I found that you can send milk off to be tested. If you want to get like a bacteria count or see if there's anything in it, you can send milk off to be tested. So if that makes you feel better about it, you totally can. But then I also took a couple screenshots. I think this is probably the majority of people in that group and their thoughts on it. But one person said, if the calf is healthy, the milk is fine. Somebody said, anytime I consume it, if my stomach is happy, it's good. <laughs> uh, someone else said, my kids check on it once a day on cereal. Ha ha ha. Um, and then one person gave like a, you know, these are all like very farmer answers. Like, you know, we're comfortable with this because we kept it clean, you know, and so they're giving like these joking answers. But then one person did actually say, if you put raw milk in a Petri dish, introduce bacteria, and then have a separate one with pasteurized milk, the bacteria actually thrives in the pasteurized milk and not the raw. And I haven't like studied that. It's just somebody's comment on the Keeping a Family Cow group. So take it as you will. However, I know that I have read that there are good bacteria in raw milk that can actually fight bad bacteria, but in the pasteurized milk, they are all killed off. It's like a sterile product. So it's like a spot where like bacteria, if introduced, can easily grow because there's nothing to negate it. There's nothing to fight it. And so, I mean, yeah, like most of the answers were just sarcastic, but I know that that's a serious question because it's, just if it's brand new to you, it's like fermenting vegetables or anything else. If it's brand new to you, it can just be scary. And I know I was there, I know I was there 11 years ago. And so I have to remember like, okay, there, there are legitimate answers out there and you can find them if you are curious and willing to look. Um, one good source is Weston Price. That's always controversial for people. I still recommend Weston Price. You can find lots of good information on there. Um, this was another really good, just like practical comment that I read on the Keeping a Family Cow group. Someone said, clean practices are important. Wash the equipment well, use a closed system in the barn because milk comes out of the animal at a temperature that is perfect for incubation of bacteria, but you do not need to be scared of it. Feeding your animals well, following basic hygienic practices, using common sense will result in milk that is cleaner than the white stuff they pump from a commercial situation who are fed a diet of stuff they're not biologically designed to consume, who are pumped full of hormones and blah, blah, blah. And there's just a lot of measures you can take, but it's really just common sense. Like it's nothing super complicated. Like I think people were afraid I was gonna say like, oh, you know, you gotta buy this certain like filtration system and then you have to have this certain soap and all of this to like wipe the teats. It's really just like basic common sense. Like get the teats clean, milk it out, refrigerate it, and you're good to go. Now, a few people also asked about the health of raw milk. I have gone more into this on different podcasts. I have a blog post about it. I took my original video down on YouTube on my main Farm Ross Moon channel, which I probably shouldn't have done. I was just being super fearful of, you know, you know. Um, and, <laughs> It is information that people need to know because I see so many people who struggle with consuming milk. And the truth is, is that very, very few people can truly not tolerate raw, real milk. It's usually because of the pasteurization process, because of the beneficial enzymes that help you to actually digest it and the lactase is destroyed that you can't actually tolerate it. So yeah, people can't really tolerate that kind of milk. It's just not natural. It's not, it doesn't have in it what your body needs to assimilate it and use it for nutrition. Raw milk is full of good bacteria. It's full of vitamins. And a lot of those vitamins are actually destroyed through the process of heating it up. So yes, it kills any bad bacteria that could possibly be in there, but it also does kill good bacteria. It's kind of like, and do I dare even remotely 
walk into this because I have a whole bunch to say about it, but I probably won't be sharing it too much on here. But it's kind of like antibiotics that we overuse. They are fantastic for things that are life threatening. So let's say there's some kind of infection or something that, you know, you're gonna die if you don't have antibiotics. Wonderful. But we take them for the silliest little tiny things that I have witnessed many, many times natural things being able with the immune system's help to kick. And so it's, it's like the same, like you're killing all of the good along with the bad. And it's just a really drastic approach that we take because like with milk, yes, if you have these commercial farms and you can't monitor these cleanliness practices that closely because you're producing a large amount of milk, then it's necessary to pasture. I actually found this quote from Nourished Kitchen. I really liked it, so I'm just gonna read it verbatim. Pasteurize, pasteurization of milk was born out of necessity as unhealthy cows from concentrated animal feed operations produce unhealthy milk. Cows sickened by confinement and an unnatural diet of grain and mashed produce, lackluster, thin milk, poor in vitamins, minerals, and other nutrients, and rich in pathogenic bacteria. Sick milk from sick cows makes for sick people. And so, yeah, tolerating that kind of milk is hard. It's, that's where people get the bad, the, where milk gets the bad rap. So I actually got one of my questions on my Instagram Q&A was, well, aren't oat milk and almond milk healthier? And, oh man, marketing, they're not. They are so processed, full of sugar. The companies literally add back in vitamins to make it like mimic the health profile of milk. So they add in vitamin D and calcium. It is a white substance that looks like milk, but it in no way replaces the enzyme rich, full of good bacteria that milk has. It's, it's just not a substitute at all. And so I just encourage you to dig deeper, learn what it is that we are kind of like conditioned as a culture to be fearful of, and then learn like what are the actual risks. Find sources where you literally get to read number of deaths from raw milk, sicknesses that you can actually get, like get the facts. And I do recommend like, I don't know, I'm just trying to debate how controversial I wanna get in this. There are certain sources online that I would definitely not trust. Definitely find ones that have actual statistics and studies and not just like, it's bad, you could die. Like get, get some real answers and then decide for you if it's actually a thing that you want to pursue. If you're not comfortable with it, that's great. That's totally fine. My encouragement with everything, I said this exact same thing when I did my home birth, podcast. You need to research this and advocate for yourself. You need real stats and studies and evidence based and not just like this broad approach that works for everybody. And so my encouragement is to research, not just to listen to me or anybody else. All right. So another question I got is when can a cow wean? Um, when can the cow survive without nursing overnight? I think I went into this a bit, but <clears throat> this is really a complicated question because it depends on your goal. So like with the conventional dairy, the, dairy, the uh, goal is high production, obviously, um, and the calf takes the milk away. There's just no question about it. For a home dairy, that's great because you don't need five gallons of milk a day. And so nourishing the calf and getting milk for you is a really win-win situation. It makes it to where when the calf is a certain age and it's milking or and it's nursing a lot, if you even leave them together overnight, not separate, you could probably even leave for the weekend. I've read lots of homesteaders say that they can do that. With me getting like a quart in the morning if the calf is on the cow, I know that that's true. Like that's not enough to even give her mastitis because it's such a small amount of milk that we could even probably leave for a few days if we leave them together. But, so that's the goal of a homestead. But if like a, con like a conventional dairy, the goal is obviously production so they can get you know the milk sold and everything, um, they actually can train and introduce their calves to 
um, foods that will help them to develop rumen at a much younger age. And so they can get them weaned as early as four weeks. Whereas like if I right now, my calf is two months old, if I decided to just take her off her mom, she wouldn't be okay because she doesn't have proper rumen development. We haven't worked on that. She relies on her mom's milk and that wouldn't work. But so that answer just really varies. At a certain point, you know, with, with the homestead, we'll be keeping her on her mom probably for until the mom gets the break. So the way the whole cycle works, I got a lot of questions about this too, is calf is born, mom starts making milk. Just like with humans, they don't make milk until you know they have a calf. Um, that's how it works with any mammal. And then, so they go through like peak production around 30 to 60 days, I believe it is, but they will keep producing milk pretty much as long as you milk them. I know this is the case because like with the goats, they are still with their kids and the kids are over a year old, which means they could now have their own kids and they still nurse. They still like get under their moms who they were as large as and nurse, but they would not have to. And so what we'll do is we will get the cow pregnant again around three months postpartum. And then she ideally will have a calf every 12 months is how that cycle works. You will milk her for about 10 months, then give her a two month break. So this is where you have your dry spell. If you had two dairy cows, you could stagger them and not ever have to have a dry spell, or you could just like plan your summer vacation. You could make it to where the 10 month period ends say in July, and then that could be your summer vacation. You have a two month off where you wean, you know, you could take away the 10 month old calf, stop milking her, taper her off, dry her off, give her a two month break where she can just build up her nutrient stores, have the calf again at 12 months, and then the whole cycle just repeats again. That is typically how it works on a homestead, whereas in like a commercial dairy, they'll take the calf away instantly, and then they're marketable. You know, if they're females, they are marketable as dairy cows, and then if they're males, as beef cows. Now, I got a lot of questions about this too. What are you gonna do with the calf? Now, I already mentioned before, she's a female, so we will likely keep her and milk her. Now, if she'd been a male, um, he would have been used for meat. Jerseys do make decent meat. Now, certain breeds are better for both. Like a Dexter, for example, a lot of small homesteaders get them because they are a good dual purpose. They are both good for meat and they are good for dairy. So when you do get a bull calf, um, which bull calves just aren't worth a whole lot. They aren't because you only need so many. One bull is enough for lots of females. And so they are typically what we will use for beef. And so in this case, um, we did get a female. We actually bought a cow that had been bred or AI'd, so inseminated with a sexed semen. So it was like a 90% chance that she was gonna be female, which was great because that's what I wanted. They're more marketable too, they're worth more. So I also got questions about like what a dairy cow should cost. And this does depend on a lot of factors. Now the reason that ours was more, we actually paid quite a bit for ours, is because she was bred with that sexed semen. And so I knew that her calf, once raised, would be worth a lot. Now, if you sell a calf as a bottle baby, so if we had sold her, you know, a couple weeks ago, and the new owners had to actually bottle raise her for a while, those aren't worth as much. Like when I bought Bessie, if you remember our Guernsey Bessie, at four months old, um, she wasn't a bottle baby. She was actually fully weaned at that point and just fine on hay. She was only $250. So the younger they are, the less that they're worth. But if you raise them and you sell them bread and they are gonna be like a really good dairy cow and they're trained and their milk tests A2 and they're a good dairy breed, like a Jersey or a Guernsey or a Dexter, they are going to be worth um, $1,500 is kind of like a, maybe like a going rate right now. Some even more. The females are more valuable. So if you do happen to get a female calf, that is, you know, a bonus. It's kind of like that with a lot of animals. It was the same with the goats. Like you wanted to get a female kid because they obviously make good dairy goats. Whereas the, the males, you know, don't. And you only need so many bucklings or bucks 
to breed and continue getting milk. That's another perk, because, uh, okay, another question I got, so I'm just like blazing through the questions without even reading them, is what is the average cost? I haven't kept super good track of this. I can tell you, you know, what our dairy cow cost and all of that, but then like we just buy hay here and there and we buy feed here and there and I'm not a super good accountant with all of that, but I did actually find a really good breakdown from familyfarmlivestock.com and they broke it down. So hay at $150 a ton, for, used 365 days for hay would be $2 a day. Feed four pounds a day at 30 cents a pound. Use 305 days for grain. I'm assuming they only use grain while they're actually milking, and so that would explain like the two month, the 60 days they didn't count because you give them a two month break. So they said for 305 days versus 365, $1.20 a day, so that's $366 a day. They put in vet care, 100. Bedding materials, 83 cents a day. Um, they said they use straw and year year round as bedding. We don't actually use any bedding because, well, we just have that one animal and we only bring her in the barn at night. And so like, she's not in there a ton. But I'm sure that'll change in the winter. This whole routine will probably change in the winter. And cows are really wasteful and so are goats with their hay. And so there ends up being this blanket of hay on the barn floor, which is really annoying because it's like nice, good hay. It just ends up being there and you just keep it clean by shoveling out the poop. Uh, miscellaneous small items, they gave 200. I probably would say that's like a halter and a lead rope, buckets. Oh, you know, we need another water for this side of the pasture because I don't like that she has to go all the way around. There is just like random stuff. We bought barrels for feed. So they said 200 for that, that seems approximate. So average total cost of $4.06 a day, $1,709.70 yearly. And then they put revenue, money coming in. Now, if you're not selling the milk, this wouldn't really be applicable, but in a way you would have been buying it if you're going to consume it. So this says milk produced per day, figuring low production per day, two gallons, so that's 610 gallons a year. Value of milk, $5 a gallon, which depending on your state, that's like super low. Um, $10, so that's $3,050 worth of milk. Income from calf, they put 200. So as I was just discussing before, they are figuring of getting rid of the calf at a really young age. So if you get rid of the calf right away, like a bottle baby, and obviously if it's a male or a female, it depends, but like $200 you could get pretty easily. So that's what they're factoring in. And so as a homesteader who is also calf sharing, you can factor that into the income. So if I keep her all this time and she's grazing and you know, of course she's costing hay too, but right now it's not a whole lot. Um, I'm also getting a calf out of the deal who will someday be very valuable. But even at the $200 mark, which is them getting rid of a young baby, which also means that they don't have to feed it, so there's that. They are getting about $10 a day from the cow, which is $3,250 for a net profit of $1,540 yearly when you count all the expenses and then if you're valuing the milk at $5 a gallon. Now, I totally believe that's true and you might think, that's a pretty small number for the amount of time that you're spending. And I would agree with you, but it, it comes down to a lot more than that. It's kind of like sewing or doing any kind of craft or baking. It's, you know, you can buy bread at the store. I know I've talked about this so much. You can buy your child a really cute outfit from Target, but it is just not the same satisfaction of putting your hand to something and watching it turn into something. Any of you have had a garden, you know this. You know that you can go buy a tomato. Tomatoes are cheap. You can go to the farmer's market and buy a tomato. But if you love gardening, pulling that tomato out and then making salsa and then reaching into your pantry in the middle of winter and getting out this home can jar of salsa that you made, there's just a certain level of satisfaction in all of that and so it's not remotely monetary that we keep a cow because 
you know, I could just with like having my own business, you know, and, and even any job, your time can be directly traded for money. And with having my own business, I can trade that time any time of the day. So literally when I'm out milking the cow, I could be creating something for sale or, you know, pitching a sponsor or whatever on the computer and literally translating that time into more dollars per hour than milking. But I love the whole process. I love it for my kids. I love it that we, you know, get to troubleshoot these things together and they get to experience exactly, you know, where something comes from and the value of it. And I, I even like when I'm sitting there in the morning drinking my coffee and sometimes I really don't wanna go out and do my chores. I just don't, I just like wanna be lazy. When I get up, I put on my boots and I go out there, my mindset does shift. Like I was just wanting to be lazy and then now I'm like going, I'm feeling like productive. I am doing something real with my hands and my time. I am, you know, doing something that's so essential to life literally getting milk for my family. And so all that to say, is it worth it? It depends. What kind of things give you that feeling? Like maybe you're more of, there's something else that gives you that feeling, in which case it would be way easier and probably cheaper overall, especially if you don't need two gallons of milk a day, which who does, um, to just go find a local farm and go drive there and get milk. And you know, someday that might make sense for us right now. This is something that I love. I totally love it. I like wanna get more cows, but this is probably enough. All right, another question I got a lot is like, what are you going to do with all the milk? And really this hasn't been a problem yet because the first like couple of weeks with the calf, we were troubleshooting it, tasting salty, and it was like partially colostrum. and. We weren't getting very much and so like I wasn't getting this huge abundance. Then all of a sudden we were getting a huge abundance. Then all of a sudden it tapered way off and I couldn't figure out what was happening. Then I realized, oh, she's milking through the, uh, she's nursing through the cattle panel and oh, the calf has to help me let it down or she gives me literally nothing. And so this hasn't actually been a problem. For the couple weeks where it was really flowing before we had to like troubleshoot things, I made some mozzarella cheese, I made tons of yogurt, I gave some to my sister and her family, we made kefir, and then we started having the issue where we didn't have enough again, and so I'm just like, we're just drinking it and doing kefir, and then now we're finally back to that place again where I'm like, oh my goodness, we have milk running out of our ears, which is great. Um, I want to learn how to make feta, and I want to learn how to make uh, cream cheese, We've done mozzarella, we do our own sour cream, we do tons of yogurt and tons of kefir, and then we drink a ton of it too. And so, so far, we haven't wasted any, and we haven't had to do like anything crazy. I know a lot of homesteads will also give it to the pigs. Right now, with my sister having a family of seven, and us having a family of eight, um, it's just, it hasn't been a problem, but I can see how for a lot of people, two gallons a day would be like way too much milk. But I plan to learn how to make a lot of things with it so that we're not buying anything dairy. I would really like to just, everything that is dairy comes from this farm, but there's a few things I have to learn. Like I've never made cheddar, and so I don't know how to do that. I really love cheddar cheese, <laughs> so at this point I, that isn't the case, but I do want to get to that point. Okay, I wanted to read one more thing. I'm just looking through my notes like for this podcast. I felt like I had a lot to say about this. Uh, I took this from, if you guys follow on Instagram, Venison for Dinner, and I was actually thinking, I need to have her on this podcast. She, I also heard her, she was on the Old Fashioned On Purpose podcast talking about some of this stuff. But she had this one post on her Instagram that I just loved. So she was holding a, I think it was a big block of cheese. And it said, yesterday this was grass, a rough field full of diverse forage that we would struggle to grow fruits or vegetables in. Overnight, my ruminants turned it into rich, creamy milk. This morning, my boys and I milked the ruminants, these magnificent grass-powered beasts, 
The milk was babysat by me all day, warming, culturing, stirring, pressing. Now it goes into a salt bath for a day before aging in the fridge for six weeks. Daring on the family cow scale is a lesson in patience and stick to itness and milking even when you really don't want to, and tonight I really didn't want to. It's planning ahead, constantly making the milk into things for your future self. It's feast or famine when the cow is fresh or dry, but dang does it nourish my family well. Yogurt with fresh picked berries and maple, and Gateway Farm maple syrup, butter on crushed sourdough, leftover Alfredo for lunch, chocolate milk with dinner, a bottle of milk for Rowan to fill her belly before tucking her into bed, coffee with cream, tea with milk, pigs and chickens, eight grain soaked and fermented in whey or skim milk. That's just today. Thank you, my magnificent bovines. Anyways, I what, what I really took away from that, what I loved, is people talk about, a lot of times, with cows. They're being so large and useless and taking up, you know, a lot of times you get a lot of misinformation with people who talk about like the sustainability of cows. But there's something you have to remember. They take something so useless. They take grass and other random things that are around in the woods that they forage and pick and turn it into something useful. We can't consume grass. We don't have the stomach for it. And so they take like this wasted space and you know, I do feed her grain twice a day, but it's like a very small amount considering how large she is. They take space that just would just be a yard and then they turn it into milk for me. That's so cool. I mean, that is like so sustainable. There's a person, I actually have notes, not on here, but on my Trello board. There's another lady on Instagram who I really wanna bring on, who she speaks a lot about stuff like this and some of the common misconceptions about farming and agriculture. But that really stuck with me because they do. They take something useless and they transform it. All right, let me just go ahead and take a few more questions. I know this is getting long. Okay, how much of your time do you spend a day on cow chores? It's getting better. Like I mentioned at night, our total farm chores take about 20 minutes, maybe a little less sometimes. The tasks include plucking the cow from the pasture, which she usually is just standing at the gate waiting for us, bringing them in, the calf going in her little pen, giving the cow and the calf hay from the barn loft, making sure they both have access to water in there because they have water in the pasture and then water in there, giving the goats hay, the goats water, collecting the eggs, making sure the chickens have food and water. That takes about 15 to 20 minutes because a lot of times they don't really all need water. They're, it was already full. And then in the morning, that's the time when we spend a lot of time milking or a lot of time on chores because of milking. It is like, I would say like a good half hour at this point, it was a lot quicker when I didn't do that calf trick, but now I'm like milking a whole second time after the calf comes and facilitates the letdown. And that's a new part of the routine. And so I think that that will also get easier. Like right now, we're all outside. And so sometimes the calf like runs around before going to find her mom. But I think after she, you know, she gets like excited from all the kids and everything. But I think after she gets really used to that, she'll just run out of her pen and straight to her mom. And then that won't be like a thing that takes a while. So I would say probably in total around an hour a day total um, for all the farm chores. And then also in that time in the morning, you know, goats, hay, chicken feed, water, all that kind of stuff. We just collect the eggs at night. Kids can help with a lot of it. They're starting to help with the dairy cow, but they can't do it completely by themselves. I would like that someday. <laughs> Somebody said, how do you respond to comments about cow milk not being for humans slash inflammatory? I get that all the time. I get people just commenting like that milk was for her calf. And you know, I think they probably just haven't done a ton of research into like conventional dairy and then raw organic dairy. And so I try to remember that because yeah, it can get a little frustrating. It can also get frustrating when people give you concern about like separating the calf because I feel like people who are animal rights activists should really cheer on homesteaders because homesteaders are taking something that is normally commercial and they are 
like bringing it into this small hands-on atmosphere where the animals are well cared for. I always felt that if anybody was, you know, animal rights activist, which, you know, we all should be, like these are vulnerable animals. They, they depend on humans. And so, you know, to an extent, like we should care for our animals. We should be animal rights activists because I feel like if you're against those practices, then you should probably be like searching out local farms or maybe just avoiding, I don't know. I have a lot to say about that. But yeah, I try to educate people as best as I can and just know that there's just certain things that, you know, we're not going to understand from coming from different experiences and all that good stuff. Okay, lots of questions about what I do if we're going out of town. That hasn't happened yet. <laughs> um, now, I do have a friend down the road who just, she also has a cow and it's her first time and her cow just had her calf a couple weeks ago. And so we have this like, okay, we are going to help each other because we still wanna go out of town, you still wanna go out of town. And so we will just swap when that happens. I'll come to your house and milk, you'll come to mine. And so making farm friends like that is going to be really crucial. I also was reading in my family cow group to find someone who's in the dairy program at the local 4-H which I hadn't thought about, but like, what if I could find a teenager who's in the local 4-H, who knows all about dairy cows? That would be cool. So you just have to make connections. And then also when the calf is a certain age and really getting a lot of milk out, if you leave them together overnight, you could leave for a few days. Oh, somebody also asked about the cleanup. So afterwards, we also do spray down the milk stand. Our cow very rarely poops or pees in the milk stand. Now that she's in there a little bit longer with the calf thing, I've noticed her doing it more often. She actually hadn't done it at all for like a month, but then now she's doing it. And so we have to spray it out and keep it really clean. Favorite resources. So I have the Keeping a Family Cow Boat, Keeping a Family Cow book. I love that book. It has like all the things you need to know for a little homestead dairy. And then also the Keeping a Family Cow Facebook group has been very, very helpful. And then I mentioned several people here on Instagram who have dairy cows. Those are always like great resources and a lot of them are willing to help. If you have a certain particular question or you can check their highlights, you can find like Justin Rhodes or some of those other YouTubers that do lots of content on farm life. They have a lot of good information. Okay, and then I'll just answer one more question. Lots of questions about how we chose the breed we chose and where we got our cow. So we searched, where did I search? Oh no, a friend of mine sent me a Facebook listing. So you can find them, I believe, in certain like Facebook groups. I don't know if you can really sell animals on Marketplace. Craigslist, uh, different groups, like search, you know, like for my, area i would search like missouri dairy cow facebook group or something like that and then there's lots of information there word of mouth like for example you know a friend of mine told me whenever Essie was for sale she was going to get a bull she said hey they also have a heifer which by the way that that cow is still living at my sister's actually she's still a heifer she will be having her first calf in about 10 months so she um will be I don't know if we're gonna bring her here. If my sister wants to milk her, I'm not sure, but I will take her back if she wants me to. But if she wants her, that's also great too. Now, as far as breeds, people in home dairies usually choose Jerseys, Guernseys, Brown Swiss, Dexter. I'm probably missing something really important. I'm also going to be, hopefully someday, milking a Brahma Jersey mix. People milk Jersey Angus mixes. I mean, people milk all kinds of different cows, but those are some of the main dairy breeds. Now the black and white, huge cows, uh, those are Holsteins. Those are what they usually use on a commercial dairy. So they, from my understanding, don't have as high of a cream content, but they're super high production. So that's the reason most home dairies don't choose them because they want more of the cream. They also don't need like six or seven gallons a day. Whereas like a Jersey has a really high cream content. They'll give you that yellow milk and then they don't produce quite as much, which is more what you want. And so we just picked ours because it's just what we found. A friend of mine sent me a listing. She said, hey, there's a bred Jersey. She has a female calf and it just seemed like a good deal to buy her. And so that's why we chose ours. I was, I would say the Jersey is probably the most common home dairy breed. 
We had to go pick her up four hours away. I borrowed my dad's truck and trailer. My husband probably thought I was crazy because he didn't grow up on a farm. So just like going to get a cow, you know, it's normal for me, but not necessarily for him. But he's getting really used to the whole thing. Okay, I am sure there are so many more questions that I should take, but I feel like I took a lot and took up so much time. If you all find this really, really interesting and it's well received, maybe I will do another one and answer the rest of them. But I think I did get a majority because a lot of them were like repeat questions. All right, well, thank you so much for watching this episode or listening to this episode of the Simple Farmhouse Life Podcast. If you made it all the way to the end, I hope that you learned something new. If nothing else, I hope I conveyed some of the benefits and that maybe you will go and seek out uh, some milk from a local farmer, even if you have no intention of getting your own dairy cow. As always, thank you so much for listening. And I'll see you in the next episode of the Simple Farmhouse Life Podcast. Thank you.